All right. So David, thank you for joining me today. I'm really excited. We have like so much to cover and so <laughs> I'm like, I'm just uh, go ready, set, go. I just want you to flow now. I, all right. So we, we talked a little bit before the show and we get getting into everything from spirituality to uh, the flow of our days and what can, how we can bring the most power into our lives. And I think that's all, all of us want ultimately is like, how can I live my highest potential life? How can I live at the highest vibration possible for me? How can I feel both simultaneously aligned with my highest self, feel feeling fulfilled, but also giving and serving and loving and, and being in that vibration. And that's, that's honestly what I'm seeing you do is help helping pull people into that. So before we get into that though, I want, I, I was wondering if you could just share a little bit of your you know, quick history of where you've been both from, a, you know, training and health, you know, what your health journey has been like and what brings you now to honestly, like what you're doing is mostly mindset work with people in regards to health. Can you share that journey a little bit? It's like half mindset and half physiological. Yeah. It just depends on what I have. Uh, I have brain flips. I take people through that help them to become free of physical addictions and then mind flips that help them to become free of mental addictions. But basically, for those who don't know me, I work with the most difficult cases in food addiction and weight loss. I've been in weight loss for about 25 years now. And um, I'm an international best-selling author. I, I started my career as a personal trainer. And it's pretty interesting because when I first got into the industry, um, I was still in college. I was just getting ready to graduate college at, with a, an exercise uh, physiology degree. I actually use my degree compared to most people. <laughs> and, uh, so anyway, I was working in the industry and I, had, I, w I grew up an athlete. I was a really uh, obsessive about all different kinds of sports that I was playing at the time. And so when I became a trainer, a personal trainer, I was really interested in athletes. However, uh, pretty soon into working as a trainer, I found that more than nine out of 10 people that come to a trainer are coming for weight loss. So I started to, that just became what was familiar to me, even though it wasn't something I, I didn't grow up overweight. I never had issues with being overweight. Um, so when I first started and it was very foreign to me, I was really sort of challenged by like, well, why are they struggling with their weight? Like they're trying really hard. They're working, like they're working out, they're doing the nutrition stuff. Like I saw all these people making an effort. And I remember at the time it was, it was one of the first jobs I had. I asked my boss, why do most people that are trying to lose weight, why are they not successful? And that boss told me that it's because they are lazy and they're weak and they're not willing to do what it takes to be successful. Now you got to remember, this is almost 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. So back then that wasn't as big of a stigma as it is now. Like people weren't, it was more of a foregone conclusion that if you were overweight, you were lazy back then. Now we know a lot more like in this younger generation right. we know that we're in now. We know a lot more about that there's more to it than just the effort you're putting in. There's other stuff going on. Totally. At that time, that wasn't out of the ordinary for someone to say that. However, it was the first time I heard it. And when my boss was telling me this, I was watching a woman on a uh, cross trainer, right? She's doing both yeah. the bottom and the top. And she's working her butt off. And she's, right. she's probably like 100 pounds overweight. Right. She was there every morning. <laughs> she did that for like two hours. And she was doing all this stuff and she didn't lose any weight. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at her and I was thinking, and I just had, I, I'm so grateful that I had this realization in the early, like the very first year of my career. I realized that the only thing lazy was that answer. Beautiful. To just put it on overweight people that, oh, they're right. like that because they're lazy. No, we just in the weight loss industry have been lazy and like, oh, it's calorie counting. Yeah, just follow calorie count. Everyone's following calorie counting or portion control because everyone does it. And yet less than 3% actually have success with it. So if we actually look objectively at what's going on, it is absolutely insane to follow the, me the common methods because the common methods get a 3% success rate. If a person went to a vending machine and put money in it a hundred times and they only got something out three times, they wouldn't say that it worked because they got it that three times. They say it was broken because of the 97 times that they didn't get something. 
Yeah, it's like we everybody's see one person on the pillboard, and we think we just assume that right. that's what it is because that's what we're conscious of. We see the person on the billboard. We don't see the a hundred other people that didn't make it to the billboard. A hundred percent. You know, once you get in the inside of the industry, I think you see that. And what's, you know, hearing you say that about, oh, they're just lazy. It's like, no wonder people didn't want to open up about what's going on because that's the stigma, right? So then there's no vulnerability. And then on the flip side in the training industry, there's no vulnerability. Everyone's just completely disconnected from their hearts and acting out of, this is what you're supposed to do. This is what it's supposed to look like. And no one's actually connecting with what's real. So, all right. So where'd you go from there? So in my early days, I was just basically studying. I did do calorie counting. I did do all of the common methods because I literally had nothing else to do. That was all that I knew was that stuff. Um, Abraham Maslow has a saying that if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem tends to look like a nail. So every problem for me was like, well, you got to work harder or you got to be stricter or whatever. So I was following the common methods just like everyone else was, but I was looking at what wasn't working and what was, I wasn't being lazy about it. I was being actively, I was being proactive about it. If something wasn't working over and over, I didn't assume that it was because these people were all weak. Right. It was because something I'm doing is weak. So mm -hmm. I don't accept something as true unless it's a hundred percent. Mm -hmm. that's the way that I look at it. Mm -hmm. um, now I do have methods that work a hundred percent of the time, but that's because um, I've gone through decades of work to discover them. And it took a lot of effort and, and work on and, and um, drive to, to want to know the answer. So I got into the common methods and then I got into alternative methods. I started getting more specialized. Like I started to do, core assessments and functional movement pattern analysis and postural assessments up on a grid board with a plumb line. And I did all these physical things. And then on the, on the nutritional side, I was testing people's metabolism to find out what they should be eating based on their biochemistry. So I was taking blood urine and saliva samples and doing stuff with that. And the interesting thing with that as well is that uh, it didn't matter how individualized I got. I was still getting, it was a little bit better than the average success rate, but it wasn't much better. Like if, if the average success rate is 3%, maybe my success rate at that point was like nine or 10% per, percent, something like that. And um, also at that time I got really into spirituality. I started reading a lot about different saints and sages of all different religions of the Catholic religion, Christian Buddhist, Hindu, uh, Advaita Vedanta, like all different mm -hmm. stuff, Rumi. Um, and I felt guilty when I was doing that because I felt like, well, I should be working on, like I should be studying stuff for my field without realizing that <laughs> what I was really studying with these different saints and sages was I was, I was looking at how to move beyond the addiction that we have to believing what our own mind tells us is true just accepting it out of hand without questioning yep. it. Yep. So that was sort of what I got was that reading about spirituality got me to start, if I like want to bring it down to the core, is it got me to start questioning things in life again, like I was a little kid. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, beautiful. Like, and that's what every every religion or spiritual teacher teaches, right? Is to, um, you know, I, I, a friend of mine, he um, was working with, uh, oh my gosh, what's the name of that NBA coach from the Lakers? I forgot his name. The one, you know, the legendary Lakers coach. Pat Riley? No, the other one. Paul Jackson? Yes. And he said that that's what uh, Michael Jackson and Kobe both had in, in common was, he had, and there's like a Japanese term for it. Or Michael Jordan and Kobe. Did I say Jackson? Because yeah. <laughs> I was thinking Phil Jackson. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Jackson <laughs> Guys, I know Jordan, Michael Jordan yeah. is, okay? I know who Michael Jordan is. <laughs> um, anyway. I, I played I against Kobe in high school. Really? That's so cool. Wow. But that's what he- cool at the time. Uh, yeah. You're like, I didn't like that guy at all. <laughs> um, but he said, that's what Michael Jordan and Kobe both had in common was what he called beginner's mind. Always. 
They always had the mind of a beginner, always open, just like a, like a kid, like, Oh, like that. Oh, okay. Right. Isn't that beautiful? Became the two of the best players in the world because of that, what you're talking about. I love, I love, love, love that mindset. And I, I always try to keep that. I like being wrong. I like being like, I love, uh, challenging my current belief system. I think anytime that you've had your current belief system challenge and you allowed it and then saw miracles happen because of it. it you kind of almost, we're going to talk about addiction in a second here, but you kind of almost get addicted to it. You're like, I like, I love challenging my current belief system. This is so good. <laughs> well, you know, you know, it's interesting in my, in my process, I have to take people through three different brain flips, which means I help them to reprogram their brain to become free of an addiction basically is what that means. Mm-hmm. And the first one is with cravings to unhealthy foods like junk food and chocolate and ice cream, all that kind of stuff, whatever their unhealthy food addictions are. Then we work on um, optimizing healthy foods in the, in the second phase. That's where they get into a rhythm. So the first phase of, my, of the process I bring people through is a disruption. We create a pain tool and I'll talk with you about that and we use it with the food and they become free of the addiction. Then we're building a rhythm into their life. And then the third phase is about momentum and that's where we work on weight loss. So that's the third brain flip. But I need to get them into a rhythm so that we have something for the momentum to build out from. And, you know, you mentioned in the very beginning that you, uh, that you and I are in common because we like to help people to like live more of their full potential and like at a high vibration and stuff like that. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, here's the thing about that. I do help people to live at a high vibration. And the very first step to me doing that is to get them living in a low vibration. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. So that's what we do. And that's what we do in the first brain flip. Interesting. And so how did you, how did you come to that? Why, how did you decide to do that? Where did this come about? And yeah, tell us a little bit more about that as well. Yeah. Well, as I got into more of a, a meditative practice where in my own practice, my own personal practice, the more that I got into years and years of doing that, eventually I was doing meditation retreats where I was meditating nine to 12 hours a day. Wow. I've meditated through all the different phases of sleep. Uh, with conscious awareness during those times. Wow. Um, and when I just got into that general practice, it helped me to become centered. And becoming centered, a lot of people, they, they have a misunderstanding of what, what it means to be centered. Being centered does not mean that, that you're devoid of emotion. You can experience any emotion from a centered place, but the difference is that when you're centered, you're not so quite so sucked into it and just like believing whatever your mind's telling you about the situation. Mm -hmm. You're stepping back and looking at things a little bit more objectively by asking questions rather than just thinking that I know the answer. Mm -hmm. That's what happened when we're kids. We're we're more curious about life. We want to know how things work. We want to know why things are, you know, why people are do the things that they do. We want to know all these different things. But as we get older and in our education system, we are taught to question less and to believe more. Right. Wow. And so when people come to me, I work with the most difficult cases in weight loss and food addiction because they're the easiest for me to work with. They're literally the easiest. They're already in a, a bunch of pain. <clears throat> they have a problem time of day where they can't stop eating or where the eating gets really bad. Um, they look at their kids and they, they're telling them to like eat clean, but then they feel like a hypocrite because as soon as they go to bed, they're heading right to the refrigerator for a snack. Like they're doing all these things that they don't want to be doing to, as a role model for their kids or to try to reach their full potential in their life. They, and they might really want to reach their right. full potential, but they've got these addictions that are holding them back. Most people, when they join a weight loss program, what happens is that they're, they're told, all right, you're going to go on a restrictive diet of some kind, right? And then you're going to get on a workout regimen and we're going to keep going. We're going to calculate everything, make sure you're burning the right number of calories. You're eating the right number of foods and you're going to lose weight in this steady stream, like this linear progression down. You'll lose four pounds a week, blah, blah, blah. Until you get Mm -hmm. to here and then everything's great at that point. Yeah. (laughs) So people join those programs with excitement, right? They'll, They'll talk to someone who sounds like they know what they're talking about. 
and they'll be talking about how you're going to lose this much weight and it's exciting. It's this cutting edge method. It's a secret system that nobody knows about. Mm -hmm. And they get real excited. And in the beginning, they will lose weight a lot of times because the cells of their nervous system where they get excited, the neurons, they're the most metabolically active yeah. cells in the body. So they start losing weight in this excited place. But then what happens is that eventually the newness of that program, right. after a few weeks, it's not so new anymore. Totally. So to their brain, it's not as stimulating as it was right in the very beginning. And so it gets harder, then the weight starts to get harder to drop off. And then they hit a plateau after a month or two and they figure out oh, this isn't the right one. Yeah. It's not right for me. And yeah. then they give up. So most, most people join their program with a lot of excitement and inspiration and they end it with a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. People work with me in the beginning, they're beginning with pain on purpose. We're mm -hmm. starting with pain. I don't care about people. I don't care about them being excited when they first come to work with me. I don't care about them being encouraged and feeling empowered. I want to see all the ways that they don't feel empowered. So what I have them do is I have them create a recording that I call pain tool that describes how bad their life is going to get in the future as if it's happening in the present moment, how bad it could possibly get if they never become free of these food addictions and they never lose the weight. If What if they keep gaining weight? Or what's going to happen? Are they going to have to uh, move in with their kids be, and become a burden to their family because they can't take care of themselves anymore. They end up in a wheelchair because they have their knees blown out and they're too heavy to get the surgery. Or do they end up in a nursing home where they lose all a bill like freedoms in their life? What are the, what are they most afraid of? Those are the things that they're going to focus on. It doesn't sound good. It doesn't sound exciting. People listening to this right now are probably like, why in the world would someone do that? Well, I'll tell you why. All right when a person's addicted to chocolate, for example, there's one place in the vicious cycle that it's enjoyable and that's in the moment they're eating it. <laughs> right. 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 It's not enjoyable before they eat it, before they're eating it, they're, they're going through the pain of like trying to use restriction and right. willpower and discipline and right, trying right. to escape it. And that's exhausting for people to do that. And then after they eat it, there's a different type of pain. Then there's the pain of feeling ashamed and guilty and beating themselves right. up. But in the moment that they're going to eat, they're just like, fuck it. I just got to have this right now. Yep. And they go sit in front of Netflix or yep. they check out. They do something to completely relax while they're eating it. That eating it is the problem. Everyone's trying to help people to manage their addictions. I don't help people to manage anything. I help them to just become free of them. And the way they do this, is they take all the pain around the vicious cycle and they put it into the one point in the vicious cycle that it's not at in the point of addiction. So they're going to listen to this recording of how bad their life is going to get while they're <laughs> eating the food that would realistically bring them to that place. So and what happens is by inserting a state of stress into the very activity that they yeah. use to try to escape from stress, mm -hmm. it triggers stress in the brain. The brain is not going to keep triggering them to want a food to relieve stress if eating that food increases their stress. I love this. I love this. This is so brilliant. This resonates with me so much because on the flip side of this, I've noticed that people will do this with habits that they're wanting to incorporate in their life, such as exercise, right? So let's say it's exercise. They'll go in, they're like beat the crap out of themselves into the gym to the point that they hate it. They're so, the whole thing was sucky. They hated the whole thing. They're so after, now they have this really negative connotation with that thing. Like how much are you going to want to do it? Like never, you're never, you're not going to want to. So that's like on the flip side, I talk about that with exercise. It's like, dude, you've got to go do something you like so that you can look forward to it again tomorrow. Play a song that you like, you know? Um, and I'm hearing that, but I, you are the, definitely the only person ever who I've ever heard talk about getting a negative relationship with the, during, during the moment of the act that, of the thing that you want to stop doing, because you're right. right. If we, if you weren't getting a reward from it at some point, you wouldn't keep doing it. So you're like, you're taking away the reward moment. And I can say, I got to interject this real quick. My mom, my mom went to the Olympic trials in 1968 for track. She was a pioneer in women's running. She was the picture of health. She is now 69 years old in a nursing home with Alzheimer's and has had two major strokes and cannot walk. And it was all 
lifestyle. Now I have compassion on my mom. I'm not judging her for that. Like she didn't know she was poor. She had a lot of things going on in her life. She developed type two diabetes, but her lifestyle, like if she, I feel like if she could have, you know, I have a memory of coming home one day and there were Twinkies, there were Twinkies. And I wanted one of those Twinkies after school so bad. And I said, I was like, mom, where are the Twinkies? And she just started giggling, right? And she started laughing about it. She's like, I ate them all. She ate the whole box of Twinkies that day while I was at school. And shortly after we found out she had diabetes and this can happen, right? Blood sugar dysregulation, the cravings get unreal. And I thought about that. And I thought when you were saying that, when you were telling that story, I'm like, man, if back when my mom was in her forties, if she could have seen where she is right now. I mean, it is really hard. My mom is tough as nails and she's like, this is the hardest thing I've ever gone through. She could have seen that in her head while she's eating those Twinkies. I really do, do believe it could have changed everything for her and the decisions that she was making. So I, 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 I like it. I like it a lot. It's, um, it's brilliant. Yeah. And you know, it, it's, it, this is exactly the same as what you were just talking about with like enjoying exercise, you know, something that's healthy, making it enjoyable and something that's not healthy, making it unenjoyable. I, I might be the first one that you've heard doing that, but in order to make the healthy thing more enjoyable, you've got to make the unhealthy thing mm. unenjoyable. It's by making it unenjoyable. You swing mm. more in that end of the spectrum. You can swing in the other direction. Love For it. Every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. You can only, right. you can only make a, a positive habit that's healthy, enjoyable to, to whatever extent you're willing to make your unhealthy habits unenjoyable. Ooh, I love it. I love However it. However far you go in that way, that's how far you're going in this way. When I have people Ooh. first come to me and to work with me and, and working with me is a big, it's a big investment for people to work with me. They're, they're, they're really going to commit and like go into this to do this because mm -hmm. they're majorly transforming their, their body and their life when they do. Um, when they first come to me, I tell them, I want you to stop exercising. I want you to be sedentary in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you're going to go and get the junk foods you have the strongest for and bring them into the house. After we've created their pain tool, I have them go and get all the foods. Wow. And the reason I have them stop the exercise is because I want to reset that relationship in the beginning while we're working on the, the addictions. Because mm -hmm. that's what happens with most people is they join a program and they're doing all this activity, all this work, trying to get the weight off while they have all these addictions going on. Yep. They're trying to pull them out of it. I just don't, don't like run your wheels to death trying to exercise right. while you still have addictions. Stop exercising. Let's reset that. All right. Let's get rid of the addictions. All right. Junk food addictions first, and then we'll do overeating. After those two are done, you've got no more food addictions anymore. You're good. You are now <laughs> capable of becoming the master of your own eating. And I teach people how to do that. I love it. Right? I love after it. They so become, after they become free of the food addictions in the first brain flip, we then do that in the second brain flip is they start to master their life and that's where they get into a rhythm. Mm. And um, it's only by doing those things and becoming free of those addictions that I can then swing them in the other direction. And then when we reintroduce exercise, we're doing it from a recording that's on the positive. So they're taking their negative recording, mm. they're flipping into a positive one. It's easier for them to do that after the addictions are gone. Whereas if they come to me and there are a lot of emotional suffering and I try to get them, well, let's focus on your why. Let's focus on what are you inspired by? They're not inspired. They're in pain right now. Right. So I just deal with them right where they are. Once they're out of that, then we get into the inspirational stuff. Yeah. I love it. Cause like the, the self-love increases so much when you get free of these things that are constantly just beating you down and you're just caught in these shame and guilt cycles over and over and over. It's like really, it's not very easy to be in a place of empowerment when you're constantly dealing with shame and guilt. You can't be, you literally can't be. I mean, if you look at, I don't know if you've looked at the research from David R. Hawkins, but I love his. Oh, well, actually I, I would say it's that they're not dealing with the shame and guilt. When I yeah. teach them to directly deal with the shame and guilt, then they can directly start to go in the other direction. Yeah, yeah. They're not going in the direction they want to because they're not facing the things they they're need avoiding to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I have to ask you real quick too. Um, you talked about brain flips and mind flips. Can you distinguish the difference there and why you, you call them those two things? Yeah, so basically I define addiction as a pattern of unconscious one-sidedness. So what that means is let's say a person has addiction to chocolate. And just to let you know, um, I work with people when people come to me, they, they come to me because they have food addictions and they have weight loss issues. But once they're in my program, I flip whatever addictions they have. So I have flipped, flipped, uh, flipped, uh, alcohol. I have flipped cigarettes, coffee, 
porn addiction, all different kinds of stuff, whatever they come to me with, we're flipping it. Yeah. Um, so with that being the case, when I talk about addiction, what I mean by addiction is it's a pattern of unconscious one-sidedness. So let's say a person has an addiction to chocolate. What that means is that when they're actually eating chocolate, they're enjoying it. They like the flavor. It's relaxing for them. They get some type of a physiological response that makes them feel good. All right. The brain wants that feeling good moment because they might be under some type of stress. It might be subconscious stress. It might not even be something they're aware of, but it mm -hmm. produces tension in the body. Once it produces tension in the body, the brain doesn't like that tension because the tension ages us. It yep. breaks down our health. It's not the stress that's the problem. It's the tension that's produced through the stress. Mm -hmm. That that's what the sensory aspect of the brain can pick up on. And it's like, mm -hmm. whoa, whoa, there's tension here. So wow. We're in danger. Something's not right. We need something that will predictably relax us because if we're relaxed, then we will be safe again. Right. And so wow. it reaches for chocolate because chocolate is something that computes. Okay, whenever I eat chocolate, it's relaxing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't think about what you're thinking about before you eat chocolate or what you're feeling after you eat chocolate. It's just looking at what you're doing in the moment. Yeah, beautiful. It's a, it's, you're right. It's a survival longevity mechanism that the brain is hardwired to do. Right. So, so these, these brain flips that you're doing, these are more on the physical level. Yes. And the mind the brain flips. Yeah. The brain flips are physical. So the first brain flip is with junk food. All right. And then the second brain flip is now they're free of junk food cravings. Now we're just working on their portions and their frequency of eating in the, mm. with healthy foods, all right? And we're getting them into an optimal rhythm, which is the opposite of the rhythm that your mother was in. Mm -hmm. right? Your mother was like in the Olympic trials. You don't get to that type of level typically unless you're more focused on maximal than optimal. Right, totally. Optimal would be more centered. Maximal is about whatever goes up has to come down. If, if right. you got to go as high performance as you possibly can, at some point you're breaking down and just letting it go. Yeah, true. If you've been doing it for many years, you're going to do that for many years to balance it out. Yeah. So it's not that what your mom is doing is bad. Mm -hmm. It's just that if she could see it from a bigger perspective of the whole entirety of what's going on, then maybe she can start to move out of it. And until we have that big picture view of something, it's hard to transcend it until that happens. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then how many brain flips are there? There's three brain flips and there's three mind flips. So Got the it. brain flips are cravings, overeating, and then weight loss is the third mm. brain flip. Mm. So the mind flips are the same. So whereas, like I was saying, addiction is a pattern of unconscious one-sidedness. Mm. If a person has this like addiction to chocolate, they're not aware. They're not thinking about how chocolate is something that they're programmed to relax with. They're thinking like, this is hell on, on earth for me. It's like giving me diabetes. It's making me gain weight. It's doing all these horrible things. The mind knows how bad it is, but the sensory brain is programmed with how right it is. Right. right? right. What, the, what the sensory brain senses to be the answer, the mental brain, the thinking aspect of the brain knows is the problem. <laughs> Welcome to hell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sound familiar? Anybody? Vicious cycles are a paradox. Yeah. Vicious cycles are a paradox where the, th the brain thinks that something's a problem and the sensory brain thinks it's the answer. Right. Wow. So what are the mind that's flips? The inner, that's the inner conflict. What's that? What are your mind flips? How does so the mind flips work? are the same kind of thing. Like if chocolate is always relaxing, then when I use the pain tool, I, I got to make it unrelaxing. I got have it. to make it painful. Once I've experienced chocolate as being relaxing and not relaxing, then I am able to move beyond and realize, oh, chocolate isn't just this one thing that I thought it was. It could be a whole variety of things. Once you're free of the addiction, then you can choose what the healthy relationship with chocolate would be like for you. Beautiful. And right. You're doing it consciously. Mentally, it's the exact same thing. With the mental we create our identity based on our mind. We have this physical body, but we think of, I think of myself as David. I'm a weight loss expert. I'm a husband. I'm a, um, um, I'm a, a, a father. My daughter's just about to turn, she's just about to turn five years old. So I'm a, a father. So I've got all these identities, but are they really who I am? No, they're not. They're not actually who I am. They're, aspects of my life of the life that i am living that i'm creating right. in my life right now but they are not my life 
the core of who I am doesn't fluctuate with those circumstances. Right. And the only way to find that core to really become clear on who we are so that we can live our life with more purpose and control, okay, is to go in the areas where we feel like we're out of control and feel like we're weak. Mm-hmm. We need to feel weak in order to become strong. We have to do that. Mm-hmm. And we avoid it. We run from it like crazy. We, that's the, big, the biggest addiction that I work with on people, and it's in the second mind flip. So let me start from the beginning. The first mind flip is getting people to understand that they have an addiction to things mm-hmm. staying the way they are. Mm-hmm. Okay. So yeah. mentally, we want things to stay the same because the more that things stay the same, the more that they're familiar, they're predictable, mm-hmm. which means that they are safe to the sensory aspect of the brain. Right? right. So in the beginning, I'm working on helping them in the first mind flip, I'm helping them to start looking at asking questions in their life in areas where they've already had their mind made up. Mm-hmm. So for example, most adults, uh, they think of being open-minded as being good and being closed-minded as being bad. In order to learn, you have to open your mind. That's actually not true. You don't have to open your mind in order to learn. You can learn whether your mind is opened or closed. It depends on the circumstances and what's going on. If you're trying to figure out your way, yeah, it's good to be open-minded. Try to look at different things, see what works, what doesn't, get fine-tuned. Once you've got one route you're going to go, you commit to it, you close your mind to everything else, and you give it all you've got. That's, that is important, just like this is important. Mm-hmm. And you can learn in both phases. Mm-hmm. Right? You, can burn, you can learn in either direction. So I'll ask a question, like I'll ask people questions. I give people what I call a river of questions. Mm-hmm. And what it is, is it's 49 questions. It's seven questions for the seven days of the week. Uh, starting at 6 a.m. and ending at 6 p.m. Every two hours, they get a question. And there are questions like, um, how can I make forward progress in my life by purposely becoming stuck? How could I use self-hatred as an amazing tool to love myself more than I ever was able to before? How can I make, fo- like, have, make huge growth by following advice that I know is wrong? All right. So they're all questions. All 49 questions are questions like yeah. that. And they're all meant to just sort of like yeah. liquefy a person's mind to get them like, <laughs> what is right and wrong anymore? Like, so, <laughs> so it, it can be a little confusing at the end of the first brain flip. And they're, they're becoming free of the junk food cravings at the same time that that's happening. Mm. After they're, after, and the, the reason I'm having those asked those questions is for one reason, just to get them to be receptive to change to get them to be receptive to the idea that their ideas of right and wrong and good and bad, that's all they are is their ideas. Right. Ideas based on what they've been taught and what they've experienced in life. So if they want to experience something new, a new type of life, they need to ask questions that challenge the way that they see life right now. Totally. Totally. So that's what we do in the first mind flip. Love it. Okay. And then there's two more. The second mind flip is the hardest <clears throat> practice for more than 95% of the people in my program. Mm. And it, it works on the root fundamental issue that everyone has, including you and including me from my experience. The second mind flip is working on the addiction to believing that what our mind tells us is true. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's a big thing. When, when a person can get past that, when they, get, can, when they can move beyond their own identity, mm-hmm. um, that's when they can become free. Yeah, absolutely. It's actually I- when they are able to become free is when they're able to start to move beyond their own identity. So the second mind flip is a trigger practice. So what mm-hmm. I have them do, they're doing this while they're fine tuning eating. So they're like, at this point that they're in this practice, they're really starting to like master eating where they're, they're eating in a way that feels good for them. And their body feels good while they're, they're enjoying the food. Their body feels good. And it's a, sta- it's a sustainable way of living for them. It's not a project that they're just doing for a short period of time. Mm-hmm. Um, people ask me all the time if I intermittent fast. I'm not trying to intermittent fast, but I eat my first meal between 8 and 8.30. And then I have my last meal between like uh, 3 and 3.30. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't eat from like 3.30 at night until 8.00. 
the next morning, then that would be considered intermittent fasting based on those cycles. I don't do, I'm not doing it for that reason. I just want my life to be in a rhythm in a certain Mm -hmm. way. And so that's what I'm helping. They're doing that in this second brain flip while they're working on their triggers. So they're, they're looking at like, if, if they go to work and their boss says something and it pisses them off. All right. And they're angry at their boss for saying this. Now they're going to flip in the other direction and look at like, well, how could I be happy for him for saying this? How could I be inspired? And that might sound really confusing to try to contemplate something like that. It's easier once you've gone through the first brain flip and the first mind flip where you're, where you're more prepared to do something like that. Mm -hmm. Cause a lot of people would be like, well, why would I think about how my boss is, what, how he did, what he did was inspiring for me. Well, the reason why is because we don't really, we don't really understand how triggers come up when we get mm-hmm. triggered, mm-hmm. you know, an event occurs and then we think that we like that event causes us to feel a right. certain way. Totally. That's not actually what happens. What happens is the event occurs. We form a perspective about it. Right. Our perspective gives rise to emotions in our body based on our perspective. And then we are reactive. Yep. So a right. whole bunch of things happen before we actually become reactive before being able to contemplate the opposite of your own perspective, what that does is it broadens your spectrum of consciousness. It actually allows you to be in situations more as they really are because you're able to see more perspectives within the same conditions. Yeah. It frees you. I mean, it really, it truly does. And I think like a lot of the work that you've done with meditation um, also helps with that because you become the observer. And what I'm hearing is like, you're helping pull people into that observer role of their life instead of just being in reactive mode, living in the reaction and thinking this is all there. It, like there's not even awareness that you're in reactive mode. You just are in it. <laughs> and it sounds like you're pulling people out. In certain places, I am pulling them out. And in other places in the program, I'm pushing them in. <laughs> I love it. So like in the pain tool, when they're listening to the pain tool, I want True. their mind tries to get them to go third person because ah. going into like an out-of-body experience, right. that, is a, that saves them from the pain. Totally. That's why when a person has like in a coma or they're in like some major thing, they're like going to an out-of-body experience. Right. The reason that happens is to save them from feeling the pain. I do not want them to have an out-of-body experience True. in that place. I want them to feel the pain. But then right. later on, there's other places where, yeah, I do want you to start to separate yourself now from your own mind. Right. Yeah. So you realize like you are not actually your mind. Your mind runs on programming. You choose right. how much you are going to be sucked into it or not based on how attached you are to your own beliefs. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, you're really getting deep into, really deep into the subconscious mind, really deep into like the reprogramming aspect of it, but on a real and practical level, right? Because what happens is we read books and we learn about these things and we're like, oh, that's really nice on this really like cognitive intellectual level, but then we don't actually get into it for ourselves. And that's what you're helping people do is get into it for themselves and becoming like both fully embodied and living the experience fully. The one that, cause what I, what I just keep, what keeps ringing off for me when I hear you talk about this is just how much we detach and avoid all of these feelings. And that's, I call it with my clients, I call it the toddler behind the baby gate. So you have a daughter who's almost five, like, like I have four kids as well. So like if you have a toddler behind a baby gate and you're ignoring them, what are they going to do? They're going to get louder and louder and louder and louder. And then I'm like, all you have to do is go over to the toddler and just like look the toddler in the eye and say, what honey? And they'll be like, I saw a bug. And you're like, and then everything can be over. It just wanted to be heard. It just needed recognition. It needed to actually have the attention, but we don't. So we ignore it. And then it blows up into this huge thing because we weren't willing to like pause for a second, stop doing whatever we're doing. Stop writing the freaking email and just saying, look them in the eye and say, what's, what's up? I hear you. You know, like that's what I'm hearing you do is like helping people be able to actually get into the thing that they're running from, get into the thing that they're avoiding and get in there and do the work so they can be free from it. Now the toddler's going to go away and play with something else. Yay. Peace that can come from actually like getting into it instead of running from it. It's really cool. I got to give you some props. Like that's a lot of, as a coach, like I recognize how much caring 
has gone in to this system that you've created for people. I mean, it has a lot of deep, deeply thinking and probably I'm sure asking the universe and being guided, like, what do they need and playing with it and being open with things weren't working. Like I got to do props. Cause that's, that's pretty freaking cool. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's pretty, uh, I'm, I'm sort of like running a well-oiled machine at this point. Yeah. Uh, my, my, <clears throat> my success with my clients is fairly, it's pretty much predictable all the time. I have a few things like I'm, I'm working on tweaking a couple things. I'm looking at adding some breath work in at certain parts in the journey mm -hmm. um, in very specific ways. And uh, a few, I'm always looking, I'm always tinkering with my own stuff. Totally. I'm always looking at how I can improve and, and, uh, and streamline it even more. But for the most part, it's, it's, the hard work of most of what I've done is be is already done. I'm now, uh, I'm in a position where I am living a life where I'm receiving the fruits of my labor. Yeah, that's you awesome. And, 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 and I'm not retiring. It's actually, uh, it's the opposite. I want to work even more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you know, I, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't have an intention of, of retiring. If I retire, it'll, um, it'll be because that's the best thing to happen at that time. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I think, yeah, it's the, the pure, I love that you said you're enjoying the, when no one needs me anymore. That's when I'll retire. <laughs> hmm. I don't, I don't know. We'll see. Maybe that, that would be incredible if the world got to that point, but I'm not foreseeing that in our lifetimes. <laughs> so <I am. laughs> really you are amazing. All yeah. right. That's good to hear. I like that perspective. Wow. Okay. So if people um, want to find you, where do they do that? So what they could do is they can go, um, if anyone's listening to this in your audience that, that uh, this really resonates and you are struggling with any types of food addictions or weight loss issues, if you've been struggling for a long time or it's been really uh, weighing on you in your life in any way, you can schedule a call with me. I'm taking calls personally still at this point. Um, beginning of 2021, I don't know if that'll be happening as much. But as of right now, I'm still taking calls with people. And if you want to schedule a call with me, you can go to brainflipweightloss.com slash talk. So it's brainflipweightloss.com slash talk. And you can schedule a call to be about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, that link will take you to the scheduling page. You can pick a, a time that works for you. All I ask is that after you pick your time, if you're in the U.S., um, do this. If you're not in the U S you might not see it, but a form will pop up afterwards. Um, if you could just fill out that form, it'll only take you about a minute to do, but it'll help me to prepare for the call. And then we'll get on together one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we can either do it on the phone or on a zoom session like this. I do about seven, eight zoom sessions a day with clients or with people that are scheduling free calls with me. And um, I will talk with you about what's going on in your life and help you to uh, start moving in the right direction on that call. Yeah, it's so amazing. That brain, brainflipweightloss.com slash talk. And you know, it's, can I just mention something quickly about what Definitely. you said the last year? You're yeah. talking about how I help people to like, um, to dive into like their challenges, right? Like mm -hmm. to really face them. Well, it's sort of interesting because I start off in the beginning of the journey, getting people to dive in and face their challenges. And then at the end of the journey, I'm getting them to dive in and face their dreams. Yeah. Because yeah. a lot of people, the, uh, this might not sound surprising to you, but it, it might sound to a lot of people is that I have people have more fear of creating a vision tool that they absolutely love and using that to lose weight with than they do in creating a pain tool to become free of the food addiction with. Wow. Getting, getting sucked into the dream is an important thing, just, just like facing the fears is. Um, sometimes facing the dream is facing the fear for a lot of people. Yeah. Wow. I, it makes me think of how patterned we are to being okay with being mean to ourselves and how not okay and how uncomfortable it makes us to be loving to ourselves and see and, and, and see our beauty, see our full potential, right? The, the discomfort that people experience with that is really eye-opening. You know, that's what I'm hearing from you. It's just like, oh, that, that how much fear response that brings up to see your own, uh, 
<laughs> true nature, honestly. You're, to me, to me, it's just like it's just seeing anything that's not familiar. Whether whether it's like more pain than you're experiencing in your life, or it's more joy than you're experiencing in your life. Mm-hmm. If it's something you're not experiencing in your life, mm-hmm. to the brain that's not familiar. Whether you like it or not doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. All that matters is if it's familiar, it's safe. If it's not familiar, it's not safe. True. If it's familiar yeah. and it's horrible, it's still safe. Mm-hmm. If it's not familiar and it's exciting, it's still not safe. True. Doesn't True. matter. Yeah. So. I love it. I love that perspective. Wow. I guys make sure that, I mean, I'll put all the show notes. Um, you can get the links to everything, but also check out, um, David's book, immovable heart and unstoppable mind. Um, that that's, I've heard him on, I've heard you on other podcasts. I haven't read your book yet. I want to now. Cause I love it. That's, that's why I sought David out. Actually. I was, I listened to one of your interviews. I was like, this guy's like super deep thinking on this stuff. We got to get him on. So, um, you know what's funny is, um, I wrote the book in 2014. It took me six months to write it. And um, it became an international bestseller. It did really well. But I didn't actually discover the brain. The whole book is about brain flips, but I didn't actually discover the brain flip, like actionably use it with clients until a couple of years later. Oh, wow. A few years ago is when I first discovered it. Well, we got to have a sequel. You got to tell some stories now. So <laughs> I have more, I could tell you stories for days. We could, we could do another one where we, where we talk about what clients go through. Yeah. yeah. The average time it takes for people to become junk, become free of junk food. All junk food is roughly about two weeks with what I wow. do. That's and then, cool. and then optimizing their meals takes about another week and a half to two weeks. They're not doing it like two weeks and then the next week and a half they're doing this one. There's preparation that they've got to do in between the brain flips to be prepared for the next one. They don't just jump right in. Uh Um, But they're free of food struggles fairly quickly within a matter of a month or two. That's amazing. I mean, really, truly it's healing work that you're doing. (laughs) There's so many people that need this. It's just the healing. Then, then yeah, go do your little workout program that you're on. (laughs) Sure. Now it's all just, now it's just mechanics, but that's the thing is like, we want to jump into the mechanics without doing any of the underlying issues. And that's why we never get there. Just like you were saying earlier. So thank you for doing the work that you're doing. I hope anybody listening, like if this resonated with you, just reach out just try it. Just invest in yourself. I'm going to put the link that he gave, gave you um, in the show notes. So check it's that a free out. Call too. It's a free call and there's no obligations. That's amazing. And I know that you don't always do one-on-one coaching. So try to get it. In. If this is resonating with you on a spiritual level right now, like try to get in on that while he's still doing it, you know? Um, so, so yeah, we'll put the links in the show and David, the people thank in you. The future that will be doing the calls will people be people that have graduated my program. So cool. even if they're not talking, if they don't see this in you know, mid 2020, whenever we're doing this. And then they see it later on in 2021 or whatever. Um, If you do schedule a call, you'll be scheduling a call with me or with someone who has graduated my program and is now turned around and has become a brain flip guide and is helping others. I'm going to be flipping the obesity epidemic with it. And I'm doing it with the people that graduate from my clients. Love it. Amazing. My clients are the ones that are going to change the world. Okay. Yeah, that's so cool. And you know that the, because they have that empathy, <laughs> it's going to be very powerful to be able to relate to people who have also, are also on that, on that path. So thank you for doing the work that you're doing. Thank you for sharing with us today. It's beautiful. It's amazing. It's so needed. So um, yeah, again, thank you. And guys, um, be sure to check out David. I'll put all the links underneath the show, both on YouTube and on all the podcast platforms. Um, and yeah, thanks for being here. Thank you.